Robert Sardello told a few stories this morning, but um, I want to tell you the real story. It, James Hillman came to Dallas, Texas because of Robert Sardello. No. Right, Joanne? I, I, I I mean, <laughs> there's, there's no question. I don't think anyone has disputed it, but he, um, he didn't tell you that story. Joanne and I were reading Jung together weekly, and we invited this new professor of phenomenology, phenomenological psychology from Duquesne, to join us. And so we were reading Jung, and Robert came in one day with this. He said, you, we've got to read Hillman, James Hillman. And we started reading Hillman, and that is the history, as they say. Uh, Robert Sardello is a, a beginner, an initiator. Um, he, he's really Genesis. He just thinks of ideas and they seem to happen. And that's what has happened to our relationship with him for over 40, almost 50 years. Extraordinary relationship, just really beautiful. Joanne and I and Robert went to Taos, New Mexico in 75 or 76. Robert brought James to University of Dallas. Then we went to Taos to plan the f first, inter did you tell this this morning, the first archetypal psychology conference, the first international archetypal psychology conference to be held at the University of Dallas in seven, it's January of 77. So we went to Taos in 76, met with Jim and Pat. They were there at the D.H. Lawrence Ranch. And it was an extraordinary meeting. And we came back, held this conference with people all over the world wanting to come and initiate this um, archetypal psychology. What a thing, what a beginning. Well, Robert Sardello has gone, gone on to initiate many things and begin many things. He, uh, with a, we all started the Dallas Institute together, and then he formed the, uh, with his wife, Cheryl Sanders Sardello, who's not with us now. Um, we had her funeral here in this space, and that's uh, very profound and very important. And that was how many years ago? Almost three years ago. Almost three years ago. Uh, Robert and Cheryl formed the School for Spiritual Psychology and went really all over the world with groups and talking about the sacred um, <coughs> earth and our relationships with earth and with each other and with spirit and the realm of spirit. And I noticed, uh, oh, he has a blog. I want to tell you about his blog because it's under Robert Sardello, just dot com. com. And uh, he's blogging about the soul of America, the future of the soul of America. And I think he already has 30 episodes. You might want to look at that. He is leaving uh, after going from Dallas. He's going to Wisconsin to do a conference on earth, on uh, eldering, on... Um, Earth eldering, is that right? Earth eldering. Now, this is something many of us in this room need to know. How do we continue to feel like we are participants of this beautiful earth as we elder, as we grow older? Because now, in our culture, we're discarded, you know, and we don't live with our eldering. Um, so this is very important work. So, Robert, you know all those statistics. He's published all those books. He's through Golden Stone Press. He's published, he has seven of his own and published almost 20. It's just my wonderful opportunity to introduce Dr. Robert Sardello. Uh, the title is called The Way of Animals in Troubled Times, like now. <laughs> in the first chapter of Animal Presences, titled The Animal Kingdom, Jim makes two methodological comments that I'm going to employ in this presentation. 
First, he states the premise that the actual presence and appearance of animals, their ways, their gestures, their display, their actions, are in themselves imaginal. That is, soul presence now world revealed. The etymology of the word animal, this is, Natasha did this this morning, it's great. The etymology of the word animal supports that premise. Animal is based on the Latin animalis, having breath, and from anima, soul. That is, animals are soul presences with breath. So that includes us. Their very appearance reveals archetypal soul qualities. So the method of proceeding is through describing the animal kingdom as image. Then another methodological aspect. As animals are inherently soul presence, they are due religious respect. The awe, seeing the exquisite beauty of a deer stepping from the forest. The, the embracing quiet when nature suddenly becomes a cathedral, when an elk appears and just as quickly disappears. The, the, the desire, hoping that the fearfully beautiful snake will quietly stay, the knowing of being visited by the gift of the swoop of an eagle. But you know, since 1970, the number of animals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish has decreased by over 50%. Over 50%. This radical decrease is due to exploitation, climate change, pollution, fires and floods, habitat loss, deforestation, overfishing and hunting. The illnesses within our alienation from the sole nature of animals include brutality, disrespect, power, fear of anything that is self-animated from within, mechanization, abstraction, obscuring immediate sensory presence, aesthetic amnesia, and most of all, the order of nature replaced by the order of technology. We might call this illness wild phobia. It is fear of an untouchable wildness, one quite different though than our conceptions of the wildness of animals. As civilization continues to develop at the expense of nature, Fears of encroaching animals increases in intensity, while we remain totally unaware that the problem is one of our encroaching on their kingdom. <coughs> Bears tipping over garbage cans and even coming into the house, sharks now lurking on the shores, alligators in the backyard, snakes on the porch, wild dog packs, mountain lions at the edge of the yard, and of course rats and mice and other so-called vermin all of whom, all of whom who were here long, long, long before we were. Useless killing, big game, big game hunting, whale hunting, whew. poaching, killing for prized ivory are all bravado demonstrations of fear. As the number and diversity of animals decreases and wild phobia rages, a very intriguing phenomenon is occurring, hardly noticed. The number of animals appearing as what are traditionally called white spirit animals is dramatically increasing. That's in, that's in Sweden. 
moose in Sweden. So the name White Spirit Animals comes from the animal, animal most exemplifying the name, the white buffalo. Many people have heard of the white buffalo story of the Sioux Indian nation tradition. Now though, now though, over 100 varieties of animals that usually appear in only earth colors have been seen as white animals in many places of the world. The appearance is nonetheless still extremely rare and the increase has been across diverse varieties rather than an increase for the most part in, in numbers of a single animal type. And we'll just be going through these as, as all of the stories of white animals in the Native American tradition, that is, the true culture of this land, have in common that a white animal's very presence dramatically presents soul qualities severely lacking in humans, human animals. And simultaneously, the white animal's very appearance displays a dire warning concerning the absence of these soul qualities, the threat of the self-extinction of the human animal. I propose that the many animals now displaying themselves increasingly in instances of whiteness are gathering as a presence of the prophetic imagination. I do not mean predictors of the future, but the visibility in troubled times of world soul awakening. Let's look at some of the cultural images supporting this proposal. Stories of the white spirit animals in the Native American tradition. So the white buffalo calf woman story of the Sioux nation from uh, South Dakota. Two men went out to hunt. Along the way they met a beautiful woman dressed in buckskin who floated as she walked. One man had lustful desires of the woman and was consumed by a cloud and turned into a pile of bones. That's happened to me a number of times. <laughs> <laughs> The woman spoke to the second man and said, Return to your people and tell them to prepare, for I am coming in four days. The holy woman brought a bundle to the people. Inside was a sacred pipe. She said, With this holy pipe you will walk like a living prayer. The pipe's bowl is made from red stone. It is the blood of your ancestors and represents the female. The stem of the pipe is made from the tree of life and represents the male. When you put them together, you connect to the world above and the world below. You pray for and with and with everything. Before she left, she, she said her spirit would return to help us in times of great hardship and that we would recognize her. Her return was, would signal the time of purification. As she left the people, she rolled over on the ground and became a, a black buffalo, then a red buffalo, then a yellow buffalo, and finally a white buffalo. This is where she received her name, you know, white buffalo calf woman. The white buffalo's actual recent appearance, appearances began in 1933 when a white calf was born in Wisconsin. Then a long lull occurred, but since 1996 at least one white buffalo is born every year. Just a few months ago, incidentally, a white buffalo was born on the ranch of a Native American in Greenville, Texas, less than an hour from here. 
There are other Native American stories of other varieties of white animals. The Mandan tribe of North Dakota has the story called the bird who that made meat bitter. It tells of the problem of a black raven that came around when the hunters kill for food. But before the meat got back to the village, it turned bitter, the work of the raven. Big Spider tells the hunters how to stop the raven. The next time they go hunting, when the raven appears, Coyote snares him. When the raven was captured, it was peculiar in appearance. It had the head of a man and the body of a black raven. The face was human, but had no hair. The body had wings and a long neck. Coyote threw raven into the fire, crushed the bones, and out flew a flock of black ravens and a white raven, saying, when the world is about to end, I will come to you again. And then there's a Zuni story, a white wolf woman. A Zuni woman is captured from her village and raped by a Navajo. She escapes with, a, with the help of a white wolf and returns to the village accompanied by the wolf. The villagers are about to kill the wolf, but she saves him by speaking up for him. During the time that she was gone, her father died, and he was left, and he was left alone to rot with no death ceremony without the presence of his daughter, his only relative. She is shunned by the villagers because of what happened to her and that she was not available for her father. She buries her father, then leaves the village and lives her life totally alone. She ages with no one to assist her dying. She drags herself through the village to go to the top of a mountain to die alone. At the moment she's dying, a howl of freedom flowed from her lips as her body changed into that of the white wolf. In each of these stories, something terribly is, is terribly wrong in the world. And a white animal prophet announces the time of drastic change. The white animals are the messengers and the message of events of purification. We see the awakening of unity and equality of masculine and feminine in the white calf buffalo woman story. We see the ending of thoughtless thinking by a kind of a, you know, human head enfolded, enfolded in darkness in the second story. And we see the breaking free from single-minded tribalism as well as abuse in the third story. But it's when these changes happen, then purification is happening. We cannot, but these purifications are not now done and over. We can't say, well, thank goodness for that. There, there's no more inequality. Or thank goodness there's no thinking as mere information from the head. Or thank goodness there's no more abuse and no more discrimination. Nor are, there stor are, nor are the stories a morality kind of a play saying, this is what will happen if we don't change. That's, none of that is going on. When some wrong seems righted, then the animals are giving warning. Purification belongs to the soul. Righted wrongs return again and again, each time with a new intensity and in a new guise taking us always to the brink of self-extinction when loss of soul culturally occurs. When some wrongs seem righted, then the white animals are giving warning. Purification belongs to the soul. Righted wrongs return again and again. They're, 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 but each time they return with a new intensity, and in a new guise, taking us to the brink of self-extinction when loss of soul culturally occurs. So. The 
the white animal times of purification and announced the permanence of purification as a central function of the animal kingdom. Purification is not punishment, but restoring the world soul by the presence of the pure animal soul. The appearance of a white spirit animal renews immediately and with power, knowing the nature of all animals as soul presence. Culturally, the white animals appearing in this time signal a time of the awakening of a different kind of awareness than that of opposing what we cannot control. One way of hearing the changing color of the buffalo from black to red to yellow to white as the woman in the white buffalo calf woman story rolls on the ground, that, that's an image of alchemical transformation. Extraordinary that it would be in the in that. And so, so, so it's the arrival now of the alchemical stage of whitening, the albedo of alchemy, a stage now of world soul transformation happening. The connection between al alchemy and the white buffalo clarifies when we learn that albedo is the alchemical term or luna, moon, the moon. Albedo, the whitening of alchemy, luna, is also called terra alba, the white earth, earth purifying. And it occurs between the alchemical stages of bl black and red. We, we've been in the blacks, we've been in the negrito since Roman time. So the albedo occurs when the time of soul as unconscious, dark in that sense, begins to lift. In contemporary times, the lifting, the lifting of the negrito shows as the weakening of the rigid boundary between what is out there and what is in But the deep in here, that boundary is dissolving. As a sep uh, soul as separate from daily awareness no longer holds. This delusion, this dissolution, <laughs> this dissolution feels like the utter loss of meaning for attachments to whatever has been seen, thought, and understood as obvious disintegrate. Luna indirectly illuminates soul. That is, it exposes what lies hidden in psychic nature through feelings no longer able to be repressed. The white animals, prophetic illuminators, announce psychic or soul awareness, bringing the capacity to navigate the world through Luna trusting the nuances of aesthetic feeling rather than the fantasied surety of the small region of awareness to which we are accustomed. The, the white animals emphasize that no animals are literal animals. They never were. They've always been soul presences. They announce this alchemical between time this time when everything appears lunatic, as these new forms of psychic reflection, aesthetic perception, and knowing are just, just at the very beginning stages to, for pouring forth. I mean, it's going to be a long time, but this is the moment of a soul transformation. We no longer seem to know the truth. We have to listen as a kind of sacred animal knowing, quietly, reflectively, in stillness, distinguishing the beautiful and the ugly. In alchemical language, the whitening slows the black crows from creeping back into the nest. That is, 
going back into the division between our comfortable beliefs as opposing what others believe. And it's also essential, the whitening is essential to holding back a too quick reddening, alchemical reddening, would be, would, that is an intensification of the unreflective physicalness of shaping the world according to greedy desires. Vulnerable white animals appearing in the midst of so much suffering of the animals shows this time of alchemical whitening as one of developing the capacity to bear suffering. As happens in the third story of the woman shunned by her community, returning to find her father has died, left to rot, unburied, and then she's thrown out of the village. And in bearing the suffering, she becomes the albedo. She turns into the white wolf, whose most notable soul display concerns howling at the moon, that is, speaking soulfully with and within Luna. The two, suffering and bearing suffering, are radically different. So think, suffering regrets the loss of purity of original innocence. It has no vessel to hold, receive, reflect on, and realize that the, the desire to act innocent of anything, of any horrid happening in the world is impossible. We're not any of us, none of us are innocent of genocide, discrimination, pollution, warmongering, corporate malfeasance, and all the rest. Nobody is innocent. When something seriously goes wrong in life or in the world, we feel, well, why did this happen to happen to us? Why did this happen to us? We didn't do anything. The anonymous, they are the blame. We try to claim our original innocence. Bearing suffering, see, this is like the, the, the animals are like or, uh, original innocence. The white animals are a second innocence a new, a different innocence. Bearing suffering, the gift of the white animals, is a second innocence, a feeling, reflection, holding, considering, waiting, silence, stillness, avoiding falling into the motion of emotion. Complaining and blaming gives way to bearing what is happening. As a pregnant woman bears her coming child, the loss of her first innocence and the birth of earned innocence or whiteness entering true freedom. Animals suffer terribly in this time. The white animals come and announce through their soul presence that animals are truly free, even though they may be shocked in the next instant. When we see the white animals, even in a photograph, a particular striking quality of the white reveals itself, the pure stillness, the inherent peace of these presences, stillness in motion, touching that soul stillness within the human animal, a stillness first felt as threatening, as something strange, as if some unknown and wild thing may be stalking us. What most characterizes the white animal is how soul wildness presents itself in a different manner than the wildness of our imagination of animals as undomesticated, doing as they will, no restraints, predatory, dangerous, in need of control. The animals become disturbed only when their silence and stillness is disturbed. It is their capacity of stillness that is being hunted down because we cannot stand wild stillness. The stillness of the white animals shows their true angelic essence 
that they are pure light presences, more like visitors to earth, mythical beings, deities, angelic. They appear like images of the full moon, white radiance, stillness in movement, displaying the ease which, which, with which the unearthly can reside with the earthly, instructing through their very presence. They do not appear to be drawing attention to themselves by their outstanding difference. They exhibit complete vulnerability. The white animals reveal a, a new intensity of what all animals bring. They are our soul sustenance, acts of love, pure generosity, the archetypal presences of environmental, emotional, spiritual, and cultural health. We know about these values and our convenient way of knowing without becoming now begins to shatter. Thank you.